morning coming from Job chapter 42 verses 1 to 6. Job chapter 6, uh, 20, 40, I'm sorry, 42 chap- verses 1 to 6. Uh, and uh, let's read these verses responsively, uh, one verse each. Starting from verse 1 all the way to verse 6, and we'll read verse 6 together. <clears throat> this is the word of God. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Amen. This is the word of God. Uh, what is the meaning of life? <laughs> That's a very broad question I'd like to start with this morning. There's a whole area of study on this topic, and it's called philosophy. What is the meaning of life? What is the significance of life? Um, for those of us who, you know, um, not just us, but everybody who have uh, pursued this question, what is the meaning of life, they hit a roadblock at a particular topic. And the topic is the topic of pain and suffering in this world. I believe it was Epicurus, the Greek philosopher, ancient Greek philosopher, who first uh, encountered this conundrum, this mystery that he could not solve. And it was later in the 18th century uh, by David Hume, the philosopher, he also addressed the same question. And it is this dilemma. Uh, If he is willing is he willing to prevent evil but not able is god willing to prevent evil but not able if that's the case then he is incompetent he is not almighty god right the next uh, logic is is he, if he is uh, able but not willing then he must be malevolent he must be an evil being the third phase is is he both able and willing? And the the question becomes, how come there's evil in this world? The uh, logic of these questions uh, is that uh, if uh, there is evil in this world, actually because there is evil in this world, uh, there cannot exist, coexist a good God. And therefore, God must not exist. That is the conclusion that uh, the ancient philosophers and atheist philosophers want to come to at the end. Um, People have a hard time figuring out this problem of evil and suffering in this world. How can there be a good God, yet evil persists in this world? And uh, they find at the conclusion that there is no meaning in uh, suffering and evil. Therefore, there must be no God who gives purpose and meaning to this world. This is the human logic and and rationale uh, for uh, the meaning of life, meaning of suffering. But uh, the book of Job that we were reading this morning begs to differ, gives us a very different perspective, not just human knowledge and wisdom and reasoning in our, with our small brains, but God gives us a very different answer to this very important question, what is the meaning of suffering? We've been looking at the Gospel Project series this whole uh, spring, and now into the summer. Uh, we are in, uh, in the lesson 11. Uh, lesson 12 is the very last one, so we're close to the end. And we've been looking at how God's kingdom has been built through Saul and David and Solomon. And we looked at last week uh, Solomon's literature, the Ecclesiastes, the wisdom of, of joyful life. How can we have true joy in our lives? And we saw that everything that comes from the hand of God is what gives us joy. Not the instantaneous, not the man-made things, but God-given things. As we appreciate that and we thank God for those things, those are the true sources of eternal joy. Well, today we look at a flip side of that aspect of life. We look at the painful life, not the joyful life, but there's a painful side of life. What is the meaning of significance of this pain in our lives? If this is also given by God, there must be a purpose, there must be a reason, there must be a way to comprehend the struggles and evil and suffering that we encounter probably every day. Instead of 
falling into, falling away from your faith, falling away from God, the existence of God even, we want to have a correct view of how God sees suffering in our lives. Maybe in our times of trial, in our times of suffering, in our times of darkness and evil, we are able to stand up, not based upon my, my, my um, knowledge of, of evil, but upon God's per- perspective of how he sees evil and suffering in our world. The message this morning is, what is the purpose of pain in our lives? What is the purpose of pain in our lives? And we, again, look at the book of Job, and it gives us a very first per- perspective from what uh, we've been told by the world. To look at the historical background of the book is very difficult because we don't know who wrote it. We don't know when it was written. We don't know where it was written. It is a truly a book of an enigmatic book. Uh, some say it was written during the time of Abraham. Some say it was written during the time post-exilic time. So that's a broad spectrum, by the way. Hundreds of years. We don't know. We can't pinpoint. Uh, the book itself does not give us a reference when this was written. Also, the who. You know, who was Job? There is no father. There is no ancestor. There is no name attached to his name. Well, only th- thing we do know about Job is that he was a person that was living in a place called Uz, U-Z. And where is Uz? We don't know. <laughs> Again, it could be somewhere down in Edom, you know, south of Judah. It could be somewhere in like the Aramean country, east of Jordan. But uh, one thing we know for sure is not part of the Holy Land. Uh, and uh, we know that he probably was not a Israelite. Uh, he was, the, God, the Bible tell, does tell us that he was a God-fearer, and he respected and he worshipped God. We find that out in chapter 1 of this amazing book. And we also know that he was an ordinary guy, ordinary Joe, and he was blessed by God. So he was healthy. He had a, a wonderful, prosperous family, in fact. He had 10 children, 7 sons, and 3 daughters. He had many, many numerous camels and, and sheep. He had numerous servants. He, he was wealthy. He was doing pretty well, pretty good in his land. But the thing that makes Joe very interesting for us and very special for us is that he knew suffering. He was selected by God to experience torture and suffering and evil uh, that was caused by Satan. You know, normally when we look at suffering in our world, we just don't know why. But the uh, very interesting fact about this book is that uh, God kind of flips the other side of suffering and shows us the reason that there was suffering in Job's life. This is a very special book. In fact, in chapter 2, verse 1, do we have that on the screen, Brother Faisal? No? It's not? Okay. Um, if you have your Bibles, you can open to chapter 2. Actually, I would like to um, see a couple of verses there just for reference uh, in this important book. Chapter 2, and it says, Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. It says there were the sons of God. And now these, these are not like, you know, Jesus and, you know, other sons. But uh, this is referring to the angels, the holy angels, the messengers of God. So they were in the presence of God, this council of God. And also, it says in verse 1, And Satan also came among them in present before himself before the Lord. We see the uh, angel, formal angel of light, now turned dark, was also in the council, this heavenly council, and was was discussing, conversing something with God. When God suddenly mentions Job in verse 3, he says to Satan, Satan, have you seen my servant Job? You know, he's been faithful. He's been um, consistent despite your efforts. What happened in chapter 1? We kind of know the story, right? Uh, Satan had challenged Job's faith and told God, you know, if you allow me to take away his wealth. If you allow me to take away his families. Let's see what happened to his faith. Let's see if he's still faithful. And so Satan, God allows this. And so Satan takes away and steals and robs the camels and the sheep and the servants. They're all gone one day. And, it, and, and his sons and daughters were having a party. Uh, at one, one place, one house. And a tornado comes and it, the whole house collapses to the ground and all ten of the kids die. This tremendous suffering, this, 
the sadness fell upon Job. But despite this uh, tragedy in his life, we find at the, at the end of chapter 1 that he says this amazing statement. The Lord has get, uh, taken away. Blessed, the Lord gives and he lo- also, also Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He still praises God. And now we come to the chapter 2 that we just mentioned this morning. And God is saying, despite your efforts to, to thwart his, his faith and to collapse his faith, he is still faithful to me. And this is when Satan does a little bit step up. Let's uh, change gears and let's uh, harm his body. Let's touch his body. And God allows this with the exception of don't harm his life. Don't take his life. So what happens in verse uh, 5 and 6, uh, in, uh, actually verse 7, we, we find that from his head to toe, he has all these painful boils, burning boils all over his body. And we find him at the end of uh, uh, this, this paragraph that he is sitting in ashes. As sitting in ashes was a sign of defilement, that he's unclean. He's in ashes. He's miserable. And he gets a piece of broken pottery and starts to scratch himself in these ashes. And uh, his wife, who sees this, this horrific scene, says to him, Curse God and just die. She says, uh, this, this, uh, this cursing to Job because she felt uh, so bad for him. And uh, even in, during this suffering, Job says something tremendous to God. Again, he is, he is showing his faithfulness to God by saying, Shall we receive from God and shall we not receive evil? Shall we not receive good from God and not receive evil from God? And in this, it says that Job did not sin against God. What do we observe in this? passage of scripture, this story on suffering of Job. What are some important things that we can observe in this part of the story? I believe we can find at least two things that we need to observe very carefully this morning. First of all, from Job's perspective, there can be purposeless suffering in life. There could be uh, suffering that is unfounded. There is no purpose in this. It seems like there's no reason for suffering. And that could be Job's perspective. That's one observation that we find. In fact, Job did not, to play it plainly, Job did not know why he was being suffering. He was was given this pain and suffering in his life. We know that Job did not sin against God. God was not angry. His wrath was not on Job. So why the suffering? There was no way of knowing. There was no way of knowing what we, you and I know this morning, that there was this heavenly counsel, there was this challenge by Satan to test his faith, that he would still be faithful, if he would be still faithful, if he were, his wealth and his family and his, even his health was taken away. But uh, Job had no way of knowing this. In fact, all of us, you know, maybe every day, we experience suffering, some sort of suffering and pain that we don't know the reason to. We don't know why we're going through these things. Just look at the media, this news this past week. I remember the, uh, you know, the Mississippi River, it's flooding, over flooding in the mid-central U.S. And many homes are are flooded right now. And those, there are people who lost their homes. Many don't have insurance. They have uh, lost their, you know, uh, nobody has died, I don't think. But they lost all the wealth and they're devastated. They're in sadness. And the question in their mind is probably, why God? Why have you brought this calamity, this disaster, on my life right now? And maybe you've heard on Friday, there was a, a shooting. Twelve people died at uh, Virginia Beach. And uh, this government building, this public building, this uh, employee came in and shot down, killed, slaughtered. Twelve people. And, and probably in the minds of the people, the surviving families, they're wondering, why God? Why is there so much evil and hate? Uh, in this, in this uh, accident, in this, in this uh, shooter. And even the shooter died, so we don't really know what the motive might be. This question constantly comes to our mind. Why? 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 Why this evil? Why this calamity in our world? The fact of the matter is, we do not know. And uh, the Bible is showing us that it's okay, like Job, for us to not fully comprehend What's going? In fact, it is impossible for us to know. 
Because who can know what's going on in a heavenly council? Who can know the spiritual things that are on the flip side of the suffering that you and I experience every day? I do want to uh, make this disclaimer. You know, if we are committing a known sin to God, if you, the Holy Spirit convicts us and we are suffering, I mean, that's, we know why we're suffering. But, uh, you know, as people of God, as, we, as followers of God, as people who are wanting to respect God, like Job, and we experience these evil and suffering and pain in our lives, there's simply no way for us to know sometimes why these sufferings are given. That's the first observation of, of Job's life, that there are seemingly purposeless suffering and pain in our lives. But there's a second observation we also must uh, realize. We haven't uh, fully read this part of the story, but uh, you probably know the story about Job pretty well, so you understand. The second is this, in times of pain, there are friends who give wrong advice. In times of tremendous pain, in fact, there are, I bet you, almost every time, there is somebody that gives you or them wrong advice, wrong assessment of the reason. They want to give a reason for pain and suffering. Everybody is wanting to comprehend and interpret in their own way. For Job, there was his wife. His wife, remember what she said? Just curse God and die. You know, just forget about it. And she made this crude remark uh, and uh, this vain speech uh, because she was not a God fear, she made this vain speech against God. Those are, there are those who say these things when you are suffering, when people are suffering. We also see three friends of Job. They also give Job advice. Uh, one thing I want to remember is give them credit. The three friends' credit is they suffered, they cried, they we wept, they were in sorrow with Job for one week. And they just, uh, seeing this devastated situation of Job, he being ashes and scratching himself with pottery, it broke their heart. And then they cried with him. But after a week, they had enough. They had enough. They wanted to say something. They wanted to give their interpretation for the reason of Job's suffering. And what was the reason? Uh, through all the chapters of the book of Job, it was, you know, to say it pretty short, it's cause and effect. This effect of your suffering, you, this torment in your life, must be a cause. There must be a cause. You must have done something wrong before God. You must have sinned somehow. We don't know, but you know. You must repent before God. And when Job heard this, his heart was devastated. And Job gives us a glimpse of, of his heart, of his, of his thoughts, after he heard these, this counsel advice of his friends. In Job chapter 16, uh, verse 1, 2, 3. Let me read that for us. Job chapter 16, we find after the conversation, the advice of the friends of Job, Job says this, Then Job answered and said, I have heard many such things. Miserable comforters are you all. Shall windy words have an end? Or what provokes you that you answer? He's saying, your advice is not helping me. I'm in pain and you have no idea what I'm going through, you have no idea why this is happening to me. I cannot agree with the advice that you are giving me. In fact, the most helpful advice that a person can give for a person who is suffering, seemingly purposeless suffering, is to say nothing, right? Just to be there. And that's what Job is asking them if you continue to read on. He wanted somebody to just be there, not to give him advice about what he doesn't understand, or they don't even understand, in fact. For Job, he needed those friends who could surely be at his side in the dearest, the most uh, uh, hardest, uh, the, the most hurtful times in his life. We are reminded of many examples of people who were with the hurting. Right? When David was, uh, was being chased by Saul, King Saul, from David's perspective, you know, it was unfair. Because, you know, God anointed him as king. And now he suddenly finds Saul. What did he do wrong? You know, David did wrong. Saul is chasing after David like a dog with the whole army. A whole country is chasing after him. So he, he finds himself. David finds himself in a cave, a Dulem cave. And we see God sending him the brokenhearted people, the poor people, 
the, the outcasts of society, joining David and just dwelling with him, eating and living together. We see that God comforts David that way. We also find Elijah, the, the mighty prophet. You know, he was tired and he was also suffering unjustly when uh, Isabel, the Queen Isabel was trying to attack him and kill him. She swore with her life, I'm going to kill this man because he killed all my prophets and prophetess. He, ran, he runs to the desert and he, he collapses. What does God do? God sends a messenger and feeds him. Doesn't say anything, just feeds him and say, go, you need to live. We also see um, on Jesus' time, there were many outcasts, uh, tax collectors and prostitutes and uh, all these sinners. And what did Jesus do with them? He, in, he uh, ate with them. He dined with them. He was accused by the religious leaders because of this fact. In fact, They say he is a friend of the sinners. He eats with sinners. I don't believe Jesus went there to convert them, to, to change them, but rather just to eat with them, dine with them, and to love upon them. He spent time with those who were suffering in society. We also find... Peter, oh Peter, the, the fisherman Peter, after he betrays Jesus, he's hurt, he's torn, you know, he's scared, he was suffering because now he's afraid of the persecution that might come upon him uh, by the people who persecuted his Lord. And so he goes back to his town in Galilee, he's fishing, and we're reminded of the story of Jesus coming to him, the resurrected Jesus. He has fish grilling on, on the hill invites them, invites him and other friends to have breakfast. And in, instead of, uh, uh, you know, uh, taunting him and, and uh, asking him and, you know, you know uh, giving a hard time, Jesus says, just eat breakfast. And he had, they have this loving conversation. Jesus comforted Peter with his food. In fact, I think that's one of the great ways for us to comfort somebody, to buy them food, to serve them food. But not only that, to be with them is uh, the many examples of the scripture we see of how God comforted his people, how God's people comforted each other. I also remember last year when I was uh, having a hard time in church ministry, there were a couple of you who, uh, you know, say, Pastor, let's just go have dinner together. I don't know what the conversation was, but I just remember I had dinner. And uh, it felt good. It felt comfortable. I felt relieved and encouraged. In times of purposeless suffering, God has called us as people of God to be there for one another. If we have a hard time comprehending with our small brains what's going on, why is this happening, maybe it is a time for us to look after each other and comfort one another because we simply do not know. The Bible says uh, in Romans 12, Paul says, Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who reap, weep. And uh, that is the application we can find from scripture of those people who are suffering without, uh, without the purpose that we can find. There's a second, uh, more apparent uh, message that the Bible is trying to convey to us. The direct, what is the purpose of pain in our lives? And uh, this is written in your bulletin, actually, as an outline. And the purpose of pain is to see the Lord. The purpose of pain is to see the Lord. The chapter we just read this morning before we preached, before I preached, is 42. And verse 1 and 2 is a very, it's a different atmosphere entirely from what happened previously to Job and the conversation that went on. Verse 1 of chapter 42 says, Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. And we find in verse 6, he says, Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. If you read the book of Job, we find Job, he is faithful in the beginning. But he starts to get bitter in his heart because of the pain, ongoing pain, and ongoing nagging from his friends, the wrong advice and counsel they're giving. He's in pain and he's bitter. So he says to the Lord, God, it would have been better if I were not born. Oh, cursed be the day when my mom rejoiced of conceiving me. He was just complaining to God of his very existence. 
and, and now he was very bitter. But what changed this attitude in verse two, all the way after verse, uh, chapter 42? Well, how come he has this different attitude in saying, God, I'm sorry, I didn't know better. You have everything in control. That's why he's saying verse 2, basically. Uh, you are the one that hides. Um, um, I'm sorry. Verse, one, verse 2. I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. I realize that you can do whatever you want. And you are able to do whatever you intend. It comes true. And you are good. Job comes to this amazing conclusion. What happened that suddenly changed his attitude and saw a dis different perspective of this issue of pain? We find a hint in verse 5, right before verse 6. It says, I had heard. Actually, let's read this verse together, verse 5, uh, that we read uh, a while ago. Let's read it together. There you go. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Up until chapter 37, there was this conversation of these three friends, actually a fourth friend even giving uh, Job counsel. But that was not satisfactory. It still did not really make sense because he did not do those things that they were accusing him of doing. But 38, what happens? God shows up. And he's asking Job these questions that Job has no answer to. God says, were you there when I was forming the foundation of this earth? Do you know who set the boundary between the ocean and the land? Do you know how the uh, great animals of this earth move about? Do you know what gives them strength? What gives them fire from their breath? It almost, even so almost sounds like a dragon, one of the animals that is depicted here. And, 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 and he also asked uh, Job, have you seen the storehouses of, of snow that I uh, prepared for to send snow? Have you seen the storehouse of, of hail that you can only imagine? Who has commanded the, the, which way the light should go in the universe? Who has commanded and directed the wind in this world? And all, to all these overwhelming questions, Job had no answer. So all he could do was just shut up. He could not dare answer God in any way. When God gave a God-sized answer to Job, regardless of what his true question was, it didn't matter to him anymore. He could only step back, maybe uh, fall to the ground and say, I have no answer to you, God. God, you are God and I am not. Maybe it could feel like this in, in our daily lives. You know, most of you, you know, commute by car, right, to your workplace each morning. And uh, it's very stressful in the uh, uh, morning hours and the evening hours when you go back and forth from your work and to your home. And uh, you find cars all honking at you here in California, and they're cutting in front of you. And uh, you're usually gentle and, and kind, but... When you're behind the wheel, you kind of change to adapt to the culture of the traffic, and you're stressed out, and uh, just, you just hate it. But you, you get on an airplane, and, and you start to see the, the, the land you know, from far away, from 30,000 feet, and the people look so small. Houses look so small. The cars, you can't hear them anymore. And the, the stress of traffic is all gone from a 30,000 view point of view. It's irrelevant. There is so much peace, and you are getting to your place where you want to be. It doesn't matter anymore. Maybe it was like that for Job. He was so focused on his pain and suffering and the why question in his life that he could never get the answer to. But when God showed him the bigger picture about all his creation, about life, about the entire universe, he had no answer to that, and he realized that he was somehow satisfied. His answer was not, his question was not answered, but somehow he was satisfied. There was no way for Job to comprehend with his small brain what God was doing spiritually, the heavenly counsel and all the, uh, the sovereign will of God. But when he encountered God, it didn't matter. He was able to live another day, live another moment of his pain, knowing that God was still in control. So in short, in summary, what is the answer to pain in our lives? What is the purpose of pain? The answer to our pain 
is God himself. Encounter with God is the answer that the book of Job is throwing at us this morning. The answer to the pain, pro, pay, problem of pain is God, the Lord God himself. When we encounter him, all the problem doesn't matter. It just disappears. It is just dissolved. For uh, those of you who've been in Korea, maybe you've seen through television, there are these, uh, um, you know, uh, meetings, right, um, between North and South Korean civilians who the family members that they've been separated for like decades, 50, 40, 50 years. And uh, governments, they, they arrange these meetings once in a while, after, I mean, after 70 years, and we find them greeting and, and recognizing each other, and they're just sobbing, and, and, and they're just in tears and also in joy. We see in their hand there's a little photograph, an old, all torn up photograph of their, their family member, what they used to look like, try to match that with the person in front of them. They recognize the name. All they have was a name, maybe not even a photo, but a name, a memory, and they match that. And they are just in tears and weeping, and there's so much emotions. If you think about it, they've been through a lot over many, many years, right? They must have this question, all, both sides must have this question. Why is our country separated? Why is my family have to be separated and torn away? Why do I have to live away from my sister, my brother, my mom, my dad? All these questions probably were in their mind. But when that moment of, of uh, encounter comes, it doesn't matter. They don't ask questions. They just sob. They just rejoice. We see them holding hands for the many, many hours. They don't want to separate anymore. They will just enjoy being together. And that's all that matters. You and I are living with so many questions, maybe thousands of questions, 10,000 questions, millions of questions. We're making a list in, the, in our mind, mental list uh, in our mind that to ask our Lord Jesus when we meet him in heaven. But I guarantee you, when you see our Lord face to face, you won't you know, confront him with all your questions. You'll just hug him or maybe bow to him. And say, Lord Jesus, I've missed you so much. I needed you so much. As we see his nail-pierced hands and his spear-pierced side, as we see the loving Lord, that Lord has, that has forgiven all our sins and has resurrected, it doesn't matter anymore. All the suffering, all the pain is irrelevant. And that is the answer that the Bible gives for the question of pain and suffering. I am reminded of the episode of Thomas, the doubter, forever doubter of Jesus, right? After Jesus resurrected, Thomas was, was not uh, fortunate to see Jesus when he uh, appeared to the disciples twice. But uh, before the third appearance, Thomas says to the disciples, the others said, what? Resurrection? Nonsense! It doesn't make sense. It doesn't compute in my mind, in my small brain. It doesn't, you know, you're dead, you stay dead. You don't get up again. And what happens? And then Jesus shows up in the midst of the disciples, the fearful, you know, disciples. They're, they're fearful of the government. And uh, he says to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Put out your hand and put it in my side. Do not believe, but believe. You know, Thomas must have had a lot of questions too, right? Jesus, how could you? I, I saw you die on the cross, and I, I know you, where your tomb is, and how could you know <laughs> your race and flesh? I don't hear a lot of questions, but it didn't matter. Jesus was there. So what does he say? Jesus, you are my Lord and my God. And he probably worshipped Jesus. To our questions of suffering and, and pain, we have, we have so much um, you know, uh, curiosity. We want to know, and we think if we truly understand, we can believe Him better, we can be more faithful to Him. But that is not the answer that the Bible gives to us. As we see the risen Lord every day, just like as Job saw God Almighty, and as Thomas saw the risen Lord, that is the, that encounter is the answer to the, the thirst we have in the, the life of suffering. The Lord is the answer to the question of suffering. When you and I are experiencing seemingly purposeless 
suffering. When you are experiencing the, the times of pain and suffering that we, and evil that we don't have an answer to, I pray and encourage that you would fall toward God. Not fall away from God, but toward God. That's what Job did. In his suffering, he still cried out to God. God, I wish I were not born. Who is he saying that to? Not his friends, but he's saying it to God. God, it hurts so much. God, I am suffering. God, hear my cry. God, where are you? Are you even listening? You might think it's blasphemous, but God receives this prayer, and God eventually shows up. And as an epilogue to the story of Job, last part of 42, God says something amazing to the friends of uh, Job. Were they really friends? <laughs> These friends, he says, Friends, you need to ask Job to pray for you. He is more righteous than you. God saw Job as righteous. Not because he was perfect and faithful to the end. Because he still trusted God. He fell toward God. He, was in, he wanted the encounter to experience God in his suffering. And God saw that, that itself as righteousness. Brothers and sisters, let us seek to see the Lord every day. Amen? As we pray in the Lord in the morning, as we read his word, as we worship, let's not, let's not do it as, um, just methodically and systematically as a habit, but I pray that our hearts would fall upon God. God, I want to see you. I want to hear your word today. Despite all the obstacles, all the difficult, the situation, certain suffering that is expected today, Father, your one word, your one encounter, it solves everything. With that prayer, as we live each day, we will not live in suffering, but we will experience heaven. Because wherever God is reigning is heaven. I pray all of us will experience this wonderful kingdom of God, even in our suffering. Amen? Let's all pray.